Welcome to devmode.fm, a podcast dedicated to the tools, techniques, and technologies used in modern web development. I'm Andrew Welch from NY Studio 107. I'm Patrick Harrington from My Le Geeky in Boston. I'm Jonathan Melville from MDD in Atlanta. And I'm Matt Stein from Pixel and Tonic in Austin. And today we're going to be talking to Mike Tabor from Bluetick.io. How you doing, Mike? I'm good. How are you? So, Mike, we wanted to talk to you today because you are building a SaaS, a software as a service called Bluetick. And we're interested in learning about it, but also about kind of what it's like to use your super skills as a developer to build your own product. So if you were out in Trinidad and Tobago whining during Carnival and someone ran up to you and held a machete to your throat and said, hey, what is bluetick.io about anyway? Like, what would you tell them? I'd say, here's my wallet and just leave me alone. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so what is it and what what would you use it for? Yeah, what is Blue Tick and what you hurry up cuz he's got a machete to your throat, man. I'm sorry, you know, I thought you were going to reminisce there for a couple minutes when that actually did happen. So Yeah, so everyone <laughs> I, like everyone who thinks that I make up all these scenarios <laughs> like almost all of them happen and someone actually did in Trinidad and Tobago hold a machete to Mike's throat. Hmm. Right? So anyway, go ahead, Mike. And ask him about assessed. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I might have made that part up. Okay. But, well, <laughs> <laughs> Mild exaggeration and timeline yeah. issues. But All right. yeah, so Bluetick automates the process of following up with people when you have something that you need them to do or you need a reply from them in order to move forward with whatever your project is, whether you're trying to develop sales leads or you're trying to get somebody to fill out a form or a survey. And it helps move the process along by automating the outreach to them to follow up and say, hey, like I basically haven't heard back from you and I need an answer for this in order to, for us to continue. And it makes it so that you don't have to do those follow-ups by hand. So it's kind of like some of those drip campaigns type of things. Is that what it is? Where you yeah. get people into a funnel and then various emails are sent to them? It is, but it's a little different than that because most of those operate off of like a, a newsletter software of some kind. And it's mm -hmm. typically coming from like info at, you know, whatever your domain name is or newsletter or something like mm -hmm. that. And they typically have special formatting that makes it look like it was a newsletter type of email. And it does make it look pretty, but it doesn't make it personalized. So Blue Tick actually comes directly from your mailbox and it's just monitoring for responses to those emails. So it just checks every 10 minutes to see if there's a response or any new emails in your mailbox. And if so, it looks through the emails that it sent and says, oh, is there any match here? Is this a response to an email that was sent from Blue Tick? And if so, pull that person out of the sequence because then you've got the reply in your mailbox and you can just respond to it personally and then just kind of carry on and not have to worry about the software continuing to send them emails and hound them about you know whatever it is that you wanted them to do. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this sounds like a tool primarily for marketers, but I also could see, you know, just us as freelancers or agencies potentially doing it. Like, Patrick, have you used any tools like this? I know you're Mr. Tooling in terms uh, of, yeah. you know, constant contact or keeping in touch with potential clients and that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, more HubSpot, I think, than than anything like that. And there's certainly stuff there where you can know when people have read an email. Given enough time, you can set up any sort of trigger to put people into a workflow, out of a workflow. And yeah, Mike, it sounds like this covers a lot of what that is. Yeah, and it's funny, as you said that, Andrew, I could also see it for salespeople, not just marketers but someone who's trying to close a sale, wanting to make sure that there's just that little nudge every so often and having a tool to help them stay on top of that. Right. Um, I think the real hook, Mike, if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the real hook with Bluetooth is that it is coming from your actual mailbox and it feels very personalized. Wait, so I it's trying to help Wait, Mike invented Bluetooth? Bluetooth, Bluetooth at my mailbox now? Yep. Oh my God. Did I say Bluetooth? <laughs> Famous. <laughs> <laughs> the drinking it's game has begun for every time he box. says Bluetooth. Blue, <laughs> blue tick. Blue tick. <laughs> Interesting fact, Bluetooth, the technology was actually named after a ruthless Denmark king or something like that. I, for, I swear to God, it was like King, king Bluetooth. Bluetooth. <laughs> it, it, was, it was something crazy like that. His and oral hygiene up, was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And he ended up uniting the kingdom or some kind of crazy story like that. That is a crazy story. Story. Yeah. And anyway, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. So what is something that differentiates Blue Tick? Would that be, uh, you know, the, the personalization and the fact that it, it really will feel like it's actually coming from you? 
Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot in the software to make it appear as if you personally crafted each and every email, even though you didn't. So, for example, one of the things that, as I said, it comes directly from your own SMTP server. So when you log into BlueTick and you add your mailbox, you have to enter in your credentials, which we store on the back end in order to be able to monitor the mailbox for incoming emails and just examine the headers, but then also to send those emails on your behalf. And essentially, they're scheduled inside of the software. So if it sees that, oh, I haven't gotten a response from this person, it will send the follow-up. But what it, one of the options that you have is to have it send the replies as a reply to the previous email that was sent. So what it makes it appear to the person who's receiving it is that it looks like to them as if you went into your mailbox, found the sent message, hit reply, and then it embeds all the content from that email, indents it over, says, you know, so-and-so on such and such date sent this, and then it puts the content of the second email or the third email in the sequence, whatever it happens to be, and then sends it off to the person. So it it's really hard to tell that it was not manually sent. So you have to do some work setting this up, obviously, right? Setting up the, the replies and the emails and stuff. But what if at some point I realize that the reply coming in from the potential client or whoever it is, is something that I actually want to respond to and I want to get them out of the automated queue or whatever it is they're in? Is there a way to do that? You don't have to because it automatically stops when it gets a reply. Mm. Oh, okay. So, and that's the whole point is it essentially gets whoever it is back to the table for whatever the situation is. So I have a customer who I talked to yesterday as part of onboarding, and they run a legal agency out of New York City, and they, they're trying to automate their, their intake. So they're setting up a couple of different email sequences. And the first one is basically the introduction and saying, hey, this is how we operate. This is what we do. Do you have any questions? Would you like me to send you the intake form? And they go hmm. through that sequence. And if they, when they respond, the person can reply right there in their mailbox, or they can just go over to BlueTick and say, okay, now this, this person is no longer in the first sequence, add them into the second one. And the second one sends them a link to the, to the intake form. And if they don't fill out the intake form within however many time they configure it for, let's say it's three days, then it will send them a follow-up say, hey, you know, we've, we talked about this last week and, you know, here's the intake form. You still have to fill it out. Otherwise, we can't get started. And then it goes through that. And the, the second sequence is designed to get them to just fill out that form. So how, how do you, how are you as a user alerted when, when someone takes action? Like, let's say somebody finally re replies to my email. Does Blue Tick let me know that? through some notification and then I can take action or it's just, I just see it in my regular inbox. Yep, you just see it in your regular inbox. And then Blue Tick in the background just basically backs off and says, you know, I got them to the table, it's back in your hands now. So you don't, it's really hands off at that point. Like once the email gets a reply, then you've got that reply in your mailbox and you can deal with it as is. And you don't have to do anything in Blue Tick to pull them out of the sequence, it just does it automatically. Is it any reply? So I mean, for instance, sometimes I'll send an email to Matt and he'll just reply with something very inappropriate that rhymes with duck cough. Um, is it is it any reply that is coming back from people? Like, what if they reply with just like unsubscribe or other? Is it kind of smart about figuring out the message content? So it looks at any reply from that particular email. Mm -hmm. So you can have somebody in multiple email sequences at the same time, and it's smart enough to figure out which of those email threads or conversations that it should pull them out of. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to have somebody in more than one, you could do that. But it typically just looks for any reply at all. It, it does ignore out of office responses and uh, vacation autoresponders, things like that, where you can tell that the person didn't personally respond. There's like, sig I'll say key signatures inside of the header information of the each of each email that I can analyze and say, oh, this was an automated response and the person didn't actually respond. Also inside the software, you can send them back into the sequence. So if you do get something like you, you're sending them an emails to try and get them to fill out a intake form. And if they respond and say, oh yeah, I'll get to that later today, you got a response, but the the real goal of that sequence was to get them to fill out the form. So you can go into the software and say, hey, put this person back into the sequence where they left off because mm -hmm. quite frankly, like I don't care that they said they're going to get to it. Until they do it, it doesn't matter. Hmm. On, on that note, a uh, question about the emails I would send to Andrew. Uh, if the person <laughs> hasn't responded in a, in a year or a year and a half, does it file a missing persons report or just back <laughs> off gently? Or It contacts um, the FBI. So you can set the schedule any way you want. I do have people who use Blue Tick and they will put, you know, weeks or months in between emails. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just because they'll 
you know, the, they want to follow up later or they say, okay, well, their last email to them was, hey, maybe now is not a good time. I'll check back in a couple months. And the let's say the, that was the fifth step. The sixth step can be to come back 12 weeks or 18 weeks later and come back and say, hey, just want to check in, see if, if this is a better time for us to discuss whatever it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is not designed as a tool for sending cold emails, right? I mean, it's not, it's not for people who just want to buy like a cold mailing list of people that they never contacted and just dump it in there and send it out. You're kind of positioning this more as warm contacts, like I got a I got a lead or I got a referral or I have some reason to believe this person is interested in my stuff. Is that right? Uh, that's how I'm positioning it. So there's a lot of overlap between warm and cold email mm -hmm. to, to the point that cold email is essentially a subset of warm email. Warm email, you, you really need to have some additional features, which is what Blue Tick has. But all of those features are also useful in, in the cold email environment. So you can use it for that. And I do have customers who use it explicitly for cold email, but it's, you know, it's trying to, I'm trying to position it more for people who are on the warm email side where they've got some sort of a relationship with the person or they've shown some sort of interest in product or service and then automating that follow-up process to kind of get them to that next point in your sales funnel. Yeah. I've always looked at the difference between cold and warm email, sort of like the difference between a stranger walking up and asking to borrow your car and a friend of yours walking up and asking to borrow your car. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if it's your friend asking, you might at least entertain the idea. And if it's a stranger, you're just going to be like, you know, I mean, Matt would do his duck cough at me. You know what I mean? <laughs> for, the, for the most part. <laughs> duck cough. <laughs> Um, different phrases, Andrew. I mean, allegedly. But this this is a, a tool that sounds kind of interesting for, I mean, for me as a freelancer, or it sounds interesting to me as a way to ensure that I don't forget about following up on certain things. Because I, I do definitely have clients that are interested in doing stuff, but they just need like a, a reminder or a little push in that direction. And a lot of times I get so busy, like I just, I forget about it, you know, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the other thing you can do is you can use it for just kind of keeping in touch with people who are long term contacts, whether they're business or personal contacts, and mm -hmm. just doing ongoing outreach to them, you know, on a monthly or quarterly basis, or even semi annually, something like that. And I do have customers who are they're in like commercial real estate, where they sell commercial real estate, and people are always coming in and out. And unless they are front and center, they may be forgotten by whoever it is that's looking for new office space or new location, something along those lines. So they, they want to make sure that they're talking to those realtors on a regular basis so that they are top of mind. And if they're, you know, if they go for too long without co talking to them, then it's very easy to be forgotten in favor of somebody else who just happened to call them or talk to them mm, the day right. before. So it's, it's partly relationship management as well. Is this just primarily focused on individual to individual or could it be business to individual? So for instance, I've got a friend of mine that owns a poker training site. Mm -hmm. And he's currently using intercom just as a drip thing. Like when someone signs up, you know, after a certain amount of time, it sends them this a certain amount of time, it sends them that would blue tick be appropriate for something like this, you know, something to it would be coming from a business, though. So it might well, I don't know. I mean, actually, maybe that is something that would enhance what they're doing is if it actually came from the lead pro as opposed to the business. Mm. Yeah, I just talked to a company earlier this week where I ran a NPS survey across my customer base and I got about a 50, a little over 50% response rate for it. And I was talking to them and uh, near the end of the conversation, they said, we'd really like to know how you sent these emails out and what you did because most of our customers only get between, the, the worst of it is like half a percent response rate, but most of them only get between two and 10%. How in the heck did you get 55%? <laughs> and so I basically screen shared with them and showed them how to do it. And they're like, yeah, that's really interesting. Is there a way we can partner up? But yeah, like having an email come from a person as opposed to a generic mailbox or from the quote unquote company or the marketing department, it has a much higher impact and people pay more attention to it, especially when you get those follow-ups because they look like the person took the time and effort to send them. If people, if you have that warm relationship in any way, shape or form, people hate they feel guilty about not responding to those emails. Right. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I was going to, as you can tell, I was going to phrase the question in terms of, you know, would it make sense for a business to do this? But I, I think it actually would be more effective if it sounded like the email was actually coming from the guy that runs 
the the training site, mm-hmm. you know? So Mike, in addition to Blue Tick, you were the co-founder of MicroConf, is that correct? Yes. So what is MicroConf? Just give us like a, a quick, super quick, you know, machete to the throat synopsis of what micro t- MicroConf is. Yeah, sure. So MicroConf is essentially a, a community of software startups that's uh, aimed at people who are running self-funded or bootstrap software companies pretty much anywhere in the world. We started it back in 2011, and we've had close to 20 conferences since then. So we were doing one a year. And then in 2013, we started doing one in Europe. And then in 2016, I believe it is, we started doing two, a second one in the US. So we're right now doing three a year. And then uh, next year, we're going to kind of sunset the starter edition version of the conference, which is aimed at people who are anywhere from I have an idea or I'm looking for an idea up to not full time on that product. And then the growth edition right now is anyone who is full time on the product. And it's aimed at self-funded startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason I want wanted to bring that up is, first of all, just give people some more background on you, uh, but also to kind of get into, you know, like, how did you come up with this crazy idea that you were going to build your own software as a service and try and productize it and make money from it? Because a lot of the people that listen to the podcast, they're web developers, primarily, I would say, and they work as freelancers or they work at an agency or whatever. And they have this skill set of being able to do either front end dev or back end or a mix of both. And probably just about everyone has thought about building their own thing. And we'll, we'll get into that here in terms of the other hosts, in terms of have you ever thought about, you know, using your superpowers to build your own stuff. But what made you decide to want to do that? Because... Mike, you you used to do, uh, I mean, you used to work at companies and then you were on your own doing freelancing stuff for a while. What made you decide to say, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to try and build something and make money from it. I mean, my first, uh, uh, it's not first, I I could say my last real full-time job was at a company called Pedestal Software. And Mm -hmm. that was 2003 to 2005 that I worked there. Mm -hmm. And it got acquired for $75 million. And I had a bunch of stock options in it. And when I ended up leaving, I got a grand total of, I believe, it was eight thousand dollars so it was like point mm. zero 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 one percent or something like that i um, thought this is where you're going to tell me that you made so much money you retired and you're <laughs> calling me from your yacht in the caribbean somewhere you know that'd be uh that'd be a nice thing to hear but no i mean i could tell you that if you want if it makes you feel better but, yeah. <laughs> yeah totally not true but yeah so i went through that experience and i said well if i want to make a full-time living doing this kind of thing or if i want to make a lot of money then i need to be building my own stuff so i went independent at that point. And I was doing consulting and also trying to build some products on the side. And I had several products that I launched. Some of them made, you know, a reasonable amount of money. Some of them didn't. Some of them made virtually zero. And then in 2009, I got together with uh, Rob Walling, who's the co-founder with me with MicroConf, and we created the Micropreneur Academy, which was essentially distilling all the learnings that we had acquired in building our own software products and helping to teach other people. So right. we went into that. And in 2010, we launched the Startups for the Rest of Us podcast. And then 2011, we thought to ourselves, wouldn't it be great to get all these people together in a room and you know, from the podcast listeners and from the online community that we built and and put them in a room and see kind of what happens and pull a conference out of it. So start to finish, like from the day we decided to do that and announced it to actually having the conference was about 10 to 11 weeks. I would never do that again. I would never advise that to anybody, but we somehow made it work through lots of hard work and long nights. And then it just kind of grew organically from there. But inside the microconf community, there's all these people who are building software businesses on their own from you know their living rooms, basements, kitchen tables, co-working spaces. And those people are the ones who, I mean, if if I was looking for role models, like the people in that community are definitely role models for anybody who's trying to do that kind of thing, because they've done it. They, and there's a lot of success stories that have come out of MicroConf. Really cool. So you decided, I mean, you've had a number of products that you've been trying to build. And you decided that, hey, you know what, I'm tired of working for clients and building other stuff for other people. I want to build my, not not just my own stuff, but I want to build my own wealth, right? Is that kind of where you were you were looking at coming at this from? It was partly that, but it was also partly being master of my own destiny, so to speak. Mm, um, right. And that's really where the 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 software comes in because, uh, you know, I can go on vacation, for example, and, you know, the pe- because it's a software as a service, people are still paying money to use my software. And, you know, the, the servers themselves, they run whether I am sitting there watching them or not. It doesn't matter. The business doesn't necessarily grow if I'm not actively making efforts to do sales 
sales and marketing, but that's a that's a completely different issue. And and Rob Walling, the person that you mentioned that you started MicroConf with, he's probably best known for starting up Drip. Is that right? Yes. So Drip was acquired by Lead Pages for a undisclosed sum back in twenty. 15 or 2016, I think, maybe 2017. Right. I don't know. But we're, we're going to say it was probably more than $8,000. More than a few bucks. Yeah. Probably more than $8,000. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. If I had to guess. Right, right. So I, I'm curious about asking, you know, the other people that are on here real quick, is, have any of you, like Matt, have you thought about potentially not working for somebody else and instead like building your own thing and, and making money from that? Like maybe someone will, will pay you to be the maintainer of a spreadsheet of different VPS services or something <laughs> like that. Oh, sure. I mean, one of my great joys is making things that that only I use and they, they rarely get beyond that. But yeah, I got really close with my last like a calendar scheduling plugin that still is is private and unreleased. I was going to make <laughs> a SaaS thing and then thought nobody would want this. So yeah, I think it'd be neat. But usually I'm I'm just stuck like playing with things too long to actually <laughs> ship them. Well, if you make it only for yourself, Matt, like there's no way you can you can't just keep buying licenses yourself. It doesn't it doesn't well, work it, like it that. works. And I'm very forgiving of schedule issues and all kinds of things. <laughs> but uh, in terms of income, it's it's just awful because it's a compounding problem. Right. And how about you, Patrick? You ever considered, you know, maybe mixing in some SaaS stuff and building your own stuff in addition to the client work that you do? Yeah, from time to time. I've had other uh, just... I, I mean, ideas are easy. I think the execution is where it's really hard. You, you know, anyone can find an itch or an annoyance in their life and say, man, if I'm if I'd be willing to pay for someone to fix this, I'm sure many other people would. So I've had a number of those or there's even a number of SaaS apps out there and just they're they're fine, but their UI is just god awful. And I'm like, this is mm -hmm. so bad. It's annoying to me. And I feel like if there was a competitor out there with really good UI at a similar price point, people might just flock to it because they don't want to have those little paper cuts hitting them all the time I feel like they're using the modern internet yeah yeah, yeah. i'll yeah. mention them after the show i don't want to call out but yeah it, i do it's you know sometimes i wish i was like 10 years younger and having these ideas or being where i am at my <laughs> web development potential now because it's just a whole maybe a whole lot easier i think without kids and family but then there is that appeal right. of almost the annuity feeling of it as mike said mm. andrew i know you were also at uh i think it was appears a few years back garrett diamond who uh he had done sifter before moving on to some other things and i think selling sifter he had a lot of medical issues and one of the things he said it was his great to be able to, you know, not great, but when he was going through some things, <laughs> no, he had the SaaS thing that could just keep on providing for him and his family. Right. Um, so it's definitely something that I've thought about and would like to take a crack at someday. Well, I think it's very rude that you're saying it's great that Gareth had medical issues. No, but, no, I mean, no, stop uh, it. no, no, that, that he had that. Stop. I'm not even gonna No. <laughs> <laughs> he, did. he almost got you. He drew you in. Uh... No, I think that's that's super interesting that you you are investing in yourself when you're building your own stuff. And pursuant to what Mike said earlier, his company got acquired and, you know, maybe he wasn't there that long or whatever, but he only got like a tiny amount of money from it. That probably was a realization that, hey, you know, if I actually want to build up real wealth, I'm going to have to do it myself. Have you ever thought about running your own thing, Jonathan? You ever had any ideas where you're like, hmm, this could be an interesting idea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've, I'm still kind of toying with one right now, but I, I think going back to the point that Patrick made... Mm. Ah, boy, if I could have done this 10 years ago, it would have been a whole lot easier. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like getting a getting a software as a service platform off the ground when you've got a bunch of kids and, you know, mm -hmm. you've got to continue your current business and and everything else that goes along with having a family. It's It makes it a lot more difficult, but not impossible. So um, I'm still, I will guess I'll say actively pursuing an idea that I've got. So we'll see mm. what happens. Yeah, well, I'd love it, to it, hear it, more, Mike, in terms of just how you do that, you know, in terms of building something while you have other things going on and then also you know just getting into the nitty-gritty like tech stack and how do you decide i don't know how much you do or don't want to get into what's behind blue tick but what makes it run and how you handle that and you know the other part of something like a SaaS is that you have a service that people are paying monthly for annually for and it can't go down and you need to have that up and running and ticking right along no no pun intended love to hear more about that too that was terrible. Uh, ticking right I'm along. Sorry. He said well, ticking and not cut, toothing we'll, along. Well, yeah, that's true. I'll mean, <laughs> cut that out in post. Yeah, he didn't say toothing along. So yeah, Mike, let's take a look at what uh, Patrick is saying. So first of all, like I know that you have a wife because I used to live with her, right? And you've got kids and stuff. Like, how do you do it? This is so intriguing. 
<laughs> what? Yeah. More, more questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just like just this, hour, this episode is going to be like four hours long by the end of the questions. It's like, how, how well do you know each other? What's yeah. going on here? Um, yeah, so there's a lot to, I, I guess, unpack there. So I guess why don't I yes, start with them? Um, how start with I the tech stack and build maybe that, <laughs> sure. build the business. Get to how Andrew. We'll come back to the. <laughs> no, but the I think that I think this is actually a really important point because I think there are a lot of people that are in the position that Patrick and Matt and also Jonathan mentioned, which is that hey, you know, I've got a wife and kids, and I don't my my free time isn't what it used to be. The pressure on me to take care of my family and bring home money is a lot you know i mean it's there it's kind of a, an overbearing thing how do you how do you handle that mike so my situation is probably a little different where when i launched the micropreneur academy in 2009 and then the podcast and then microconf i was making money from those like basically up until now like it's right. those things have been running in the background like they are profitable businesses and they're not necessarily enough to go full time on whatever i want but they are enough to kind of buy me some freedom and and leeway nice. so one of the things that I would talk about uh, that I did with Blue Tick to kind of help out with that was that I think the the situation most developers find themselves in, like you know Matt had talked about the fact that he had this plugin where he built it in order to do scale, scheduling, and mm -hmm. uh, you know there's probably lots of different reasons why you've never really finished it or, or fully launched it to the public. But I would point to a company like Calendly where they do exactly that and they make thirty million dollars a year. Mm. So you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, being in the right place at the right time has something to do with that, but Calendly is not the only company out there. And like, for example, you can book me is another one. And I know the founder of that and she's been running that for several years now and they've got a team of like 10 or 15 people. Mm -hmm. So you can make a great business off of something that's very simplistic. The problem is that how do you go about it when you do have that wife and family and a full-time job that you're trying to do something on the side? So I'll talk a little bit about what I did with Blue Tick, where I had this idea and I said, let me go to my people in my network and see if there's other people who either have this problem or would be interested in finding a solution for it because they could see a use for it in their business. So I went into my personal network, had conversations with, I don't know, like maybe a couple dozen people. And I just asked them because they were business owners and said, well, what do you think of this idea? And is it something you could see yourself using? And I got, I think it was around 18 to 20 people who said, yeah, that's a problem for me. I'd love to, I would be interested in, in paying money to have this particular problem solved, the, the automated email follow-ups. And so what I did was I spent three weeks or so using balsamic mockups and I mocked up the entire application and I wired things up so that in presentation, you could put it in presentation mode and you could basically click around as if it was a real application. It didn't do anything, but I had what it would look like and how you would use it. So then I went back to all of those people and I scheduled meetings with them and I said, look, this is what I have. Is this interesting to you still based on our previous conversation? Is this what we talked about? And they said, yes. And I said, great, here's a website uh, and you can enter in a your credit card number and you can enter in your a prepayment for it and how many months you're willing to pay. And the, at that point, several of them said, well, wait a second. Well, I said I would pay for it. I didn't say I did, <laughs> I will pay for it. And then right. of course it get, opens up the conversations of, well, why wouldn't you pay for it? And they said, well, I would if my business were still doing X, Y, and Z. So I got to filter out some of those people, but I still got $2,000 worth of prepayments for a product that I had not written a single line of code for. Mm -hmm. And then oh, I man. also got you know, uh, 12 people who had, set, who had committed to paying me a certain dollar amount. And that dollar amount, uh, most of them asked me like, well, what about this, this text field where it's open-ended? Like how much does it cost? And I said, well, you tell me how much it's worth to your business. Because what I wanted to know was what should the pricing for this product be? And I knew that I wanted it to be around $50 a month per person, but I didn't want to lead the witness. So I said, you tell me how much it is. And I had two people tell me, well, one person said, well, 39, one person said 40, nine people said between 47 and $50 a month. And then one person said a hundred dollars a month. And I said, great, you know, go ahead enter in whatever it is. I think I had one person who's justified it, who tried to say $15 a month. <laughs> and I asked why. And then he's like, well, my price, he, he basically price anchored to a bunch of other things he was paying for that were on the lower end. And I'm like, yeah, this is very different than those. And he's like, oh, I get how it's different. And it's like, then I, and then he came up and he justified $39 a month or something like that. So that's really, that's really interesting how you use that to do market research, right? Mm -hmm. So you basically just mocked it out and said, okay, you people said that you're interested. And by the way, I'm a little bit hurt. I was not 
not one of those people that you contacted. You didn't have any interest in my opinion. You did not return my email. So <sighs> that, sounds, actually, that sounds on point for Andrew. That, that kind of a chicken egg situation there. He was like, Could, I've already got Bluetooth. Well, yeah, if you had, if I had Bluetooth. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Yeah. I mean, if I had blue tick, I would have responded to your email, but I didn't have it. So, you know, what are you going to do? But no, I, the way that you're doing market research on this, I think is really interesting. So you're basically saying, I want to see if there's any, enough actual viable interest in the people I know in my network that building this thing would be a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that and it worked out really well because I, from a motivational standpoint, it basically gave me $2,000 to work with to like start doing stuff. Right. So like, I think a lot of people, when they start building something, they start bolting on all these different features. Oh, I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. And they don't have a customer base or people that are waiting for it. So there's not really any time pressure to deliver. So what this did, it did a bunch of different things for me. One is it got me an early access list of people to add on to the, uh, add on as customers, people who I basically had a commitment to, to deliver in a certain time frame. And I gave them, I told them I'd deliver it in about three and a half months or so. And it ended oh up taking God. four. <laughs> That's but a quick I had turnaround. Well, That's a I, quick turnaround, man. It is, but like honestly, like I outsourced a lot of that early development. So I basically acted as product manager and I hired a bunch of people from Upwork to basically write out kind of the first version of it. And then four months in, I started trying to onboard customers. It took another six months or so to actually get them to try and use it because then I what I made the mistake of doing was saying, I will let you use this and I won't start billing until you decide that it, or until you tell me that it's delivering value because that's what I'm I'm trying to do here. And what happened was that because there was no pressure for them or no credit card payment associated with it on a monthly basis, they really didn't give it the time of day. So fast forward to like November of that year and they I, I basically just emailed everybody and said, hey, look, I'm going to start billing on such and such date. And if you're not interested, fine, let me know, but let, let, we'll go from there. And it, immediately I started getting people like, <laughs> who were logging in and like onboarding themselves, which after six months of trying to get them to do it, like just making them pay for it on an ongoing basis was really the trigger to, to push them through that. It's amazing what motivates people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is. Is. Speaking of motivation, I have to think not only getting that $2,000 as you know a little bit of a cash injection, it also makes you accountable now to these people. They, mm -hmm. They've given you money that you've got a forward. It, it, it can no longer be the thing that you dream about. Maybe one day I'll do it. Maybe I won't. Now you've got someone who is, you know, they are accountable to. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the accountability factor is a, a big piece of it, but also being able to have people that you know are waiting for it and you can get feedback from them. If they're having a problem, you know, you obviously want to deal with that, but just knowing that there's people waiting for it is an incentive for you to deliver it faster. Yeah. And when we're working for a client, we're building custom software for them. And in this case, you're sort of building custom software, but you're building it for a number of clients, but you're going to be the one that ends up owning it in the end. But I, I think what you're doing here is really cool because like that would motivate me. I hate borrowing money from anybody. And the fact that I like I would look at this essentially as like I borrowed $2,000 from people that I know. And that would motivate the hell out of me to get this thing done and, and get it up and working. Right. And if you don't have that incentive or that pressure to deliver something within that certain time period, it's really easy to just let it sit there in your GitHub repository and not actually work on it and be able to justify that by saying, oh, well, I'll get to it later or I don't have time this week. When people are waiting, you have to. Right. And having those customers there kind of waiting in the wings is it's motivational for you, but you can also use that as like a justification to your spouse because that's one of those situations that people have where like they're trying to they're taking away time from their family or their full time job or the consulting that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're not or not spending the time there and they're spending it on a product. But if the product never launches or it never makes any money, what what have you got afterwards? And the answer is basically nothing. So I, I think that's why most ideas or most dreams dreams that people have of building their own thing. I think that's why they end up dying inside their heads because you can't like it, it's difficult for a lot of people to take that extra time to work those extra hours on top of their current job or to be to be able to tell their family, okay, you know, for the next six months, I'm going to see you for an hour a day. And that's it. You know, I think that's a tough thing to do. Yeah. What what I like, though, is that you also you showed them what you were going to deliver. I think that's where my problem is, is I'm basically nobody knows I'm working on anything. And it's kind of mm. a mystery dessert as far as anybody else is concerned, <laughs> like it may or may not appear and I will be entertained. You showed them exactly what you were going to deliver. And so everybody knew what the goal looked like. The There's stuff another... you're working on, the stuff you're working on, I think is more of a mystery meat than a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a it's a whatever burger slash. You just ice cream. don't know what you don't know what's in that sausage. That's right. You know what I mean. <laughs> so, did you find that taking the time to actually prototype this thing out also made the development go a little bit in a little bit more focused way? Because you kind of had this sort of quasi completed vision of this product. It was just about implementation at that point. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it really forced me to go through the design process and decide what was important and what wasn't and what needed to wait. And I think that if I didn't have customers waiting for it, it would have been a lot easier to push out the development timeline by six months or 12 or 18 or three years even, because when you're developing a software product, it's never finished. I mean, unless it's a video game. And even then, like you... <laughs> You, you probably still want to always add stuff to it. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to put yourself in a situation where you are justifying and making excuses for not launching or going out to customers because nobody's really waiting for it or they don't know about it. And the, the, the other interesting thing I found in going through this is that that process that I kind of described, I've had customers who have signed up for Blue Tick explicitly so that they could go out to their network and essentially do the same thing because it allows you to do the, the personalized outreach at scale and schedule meetings with people. And and people use it for exactly that. I had a one of my earliest customers. He signed up and he said, I'm I'm using it for exactly this, kind of what you did. And he canceled after, it was about three months. I was kind of disappointed that I saw him at MicroConf and he said that was the best $150 I ever spent because I found out that nobody wanted this thing I was going to build and right. it easily saved me 12 to 18 yeah. months of development time. And I was like, well, that's a win, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, it wasn't quite, <laughs> I would obviously like prefer to have a customer for much longer than that. But I'm really glad that he got the value out of it to be able to see, hey, I do not want to waste the next 18 months to two years of my life on something that is not, never going to fly with customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Per pursuant to what you were saying, Mike, many people think about creating software the same way they would approach writing a book. You know what I mean? Where I'm going to do all this work. I'm going to put this book out. And once the book is out, like the book is out, you know, I'm done. But I think it's a whole lot more like starting your own magazine subscription, you know, where you've got to put a new issue out every month or whatever it is, because software these days, especially SaaS products, you constantly have to be maintaining them. You constantly have to be upgrading them, adding features, marketing them, you know, doing this, that and the other thing. So it really is a, a, a living, ongoing thing. The only thing I would say is like, I, I have been creating my own product for forever. I started with typefaces and then I started doing games and then I did utilities and I did all sorts of different stuff. And now I'm doing plugins for craft as well as some other stuff. Anyone who is listening, who has any interest at all in building their own stuff. And I want to, you know, clarify it. Like it's not for everybody working on your own and also working on your own product. It's definitely not for everybody, but for those people who do think that they might be interested in it, do it. Absolutely do it. Make a little bit of extra time, try it. And even if you fail, you will learn something Something from those failures, right? I mean, Mike, you've done some other SaaS stuff in the past. Not everything has been amazingly successful, right? It, but you learn from it, right? Yeah. And everything that you do, regardless of like the target market vertical or whether it's a horizontal product, like you're going to learn things from it. Mm -hmm. And every, I think every segment that you are building a product for is, is going to teach you something different. So like Facebook advertising for B2C is very different than it is for B2B. And if you're reselling products or you're doing e-commerce or you're doing Amazon drop shipping, like all those types of businesses are very different. And there are some learnings that you can take from one to the next. And there is a lot of overlap just in terms of general mindset of running a business that doing customer development, marketing, building email lists, all that kind of stuff. It translates really well from one type of product to another, but it, there's always new stuff to learn and lots of things change every day. So, you know, the, even if you know something really well, sometimes it's hard to keep up with exactly what is changing and how to deal with it. Yeah. And I don't think you should underestimate how much you will learn even from things that, that don't work out. I mean, Matt, you have been reading, my understanding is uh, a book lately on generalists, right? And what you can learn from that. Yeah, a book called Range. Yeah, exactly. Really good. And yeah. how do you know, how does what you have been reading in there kind of apply to this? Because from the point of view of, you know, you may try you know, X product, and it doesn't work out this product, and it doesn't work out. But but overall, you're learning something that is going to make it so that eventually something is going to work, right, which is invaluable. And that that's one of the themes of the book is that you benefit of being a generalist, because I usually struggle, you you know, should I specialize in something or is it okay to just wander around and never be great at anything is that you can problem solve really well in new arenas effectively, like the more domains you've touched and not mm. domain names, but like 
different different things you've done. So Billy Bob's, you know, tanning business and then moving to, you know, I don't know, repairing bicycles and then writing software. Like these things are not necessarily a waste of time if you're the kind of person that will make connections between them and then apply them to some new and mysterious thing, which is where I'm interested. I have a joint question, I guess, for, for Andrew and Mike. How is Billy, uh, Billy D. Joe Bob? By I'm way. sorry. I didn't mean to be. Uh, disrespectful of his right, made ahead. up name. How do the dynamics, I, I only know building craft plugins and small things I, I never release. How do the dynamics of app development change when you run a SaaS versus ship a product that the customer like installs or uses or interacts with in a, in a more direct way, like with the actual software? So I guess I'll go first on this. I think the a distinction I would probably make in what, the question that you just asked is that SaaS is a billing model, not necessarily a delivery model. So like mm. you can mm-hmm. have have, I know customers or I know other business owners who have these Docker images with software installed that they deliver to customers and the customers, some of them are enterprise customers and they will install it in their environment and they run everything. They basically manage all the infrastructure around it and the developer is providing these Docker images that they can basically stand up a new version of the software and they are billing them on like an annual basis. So although it is a SaaS, that's the billing model. It's not the distribution model. So billing and distribution are two very very different things. That terminology, I'll say uh, confusion also comes around freemium as well. Like freemium is distribution, not necessarily a, a pricing model. You can't make money off of freemium, but you can convert people into a paid subscription of some kind. And that's a slightly different thing. But I think that when when you're looking at, a, I'll say like the classically delivered web application that you are delivering as a, as a SaaS app, there's a lot of operational things that you probably as a developer may not be familiar with or may not be may not be something you encounter on a regular basis and you just have to learn that stuff so you have to do backups you have to make sure that you have like a disaster recovery plan you have to make sure that you could stand up the software someplace else you have to make sure that your source code is secure and that you are doing verifying it for like cross cross site scripting vulnerabilities and things like mm-hmm. that and you have to make sure that your apps are secure like i have uh, i have access direct access to people's mailboxes and that is a huge deal that's terrifying it is terrifying but <laughs> for you yeah <laughs> it is. So like uh, there's all these things that are encrypted all over the place. So, and that's not something that most developers would really need to think about, especially if they're building their own thing. Like, do you need to encrypt this field in the database? And if so, how do you go about doing it? Where are the keys stored? My keys are actually stored on different servers. So like my database server doesn't have them. My application server doesn't have them or actually stored in a, a external service in Microsoft Azure. So that kind of leads into my tech stack a little bit. But those are the types of things you uh, they're, they're all operational things that you don't think about as a developer because you're like, oh, let me just create this thing and then I'll push it out. And then you realize, oh, now I've got a customer and this has come up for me. I've got a customer who they created 250, more than 250 different email sequences. And I'm like, yeah, that's a lot more than I had ever anticipated somebody actually creating in the software. So now I have to go in and do like a lot of updates to make sure that it scales well enough for that. And I've had customers who sign on and one of the first things Bluetick does is it mines somebody's mailbox. But I've had people sign up and they've got three quarters of a million emails in their mailbox. And it's like, I have to index all of them. So those are the types of problems. You just run into them and it's hard to anticipate them and you just have to deal with them. Can you have a cutoff date where you just don't look at anything past a certain date or something like that? I can, but there's other things that the software does that help you basically with onboarding. So the reason it does that is because when you sign on, you connect your mailbox to Blue Tick, Mm -hmm. you don't have any contacts in the system. So what it does is it mines your entire mailbox and then it Mm. looks and looks for relationships of how many emails did you send to this person? How many did you, re- did you receive from this person? Which is not a query you can get out of a, an IMAP server, but right. Blue Tick is able to do that. And it can show you a, a basically a data table that says and that you can kind of sort and say, show me the people who I've emailed in the last couple of weeks that have not emailed me back. And then you can add those also, people in and start them on a sequence. There's a natural cutoff date, Andrew, and it's somewhere in 1972. It's 19, he, yeah, 1970, email, I believe. It yeah. wasn't invented yet, yeah. so the, oh. if that helps. Well, the interesting thing with email is that sometimes the email clients do not follow the RFCs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that's of course they don't. A nasty problem. I've had emails that have come up and said that they were sent in like, you know, the 1700s. And I'm like, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that's wrong. But and you recently from Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> so or King, or King Bluetooth. 
King Bluetooth. <laughs> it absolutely could be the case that it is coming from King Bluetooth. So one of the things that you mentioned is that you've got access to people's mailbox and it sounds kind of scary and everything. But you recently actually went through a certification from Google, right? Like they came in and they inspected everything that you're doing and made sure that it was above board and all that type of thing, right? Yeah. So Google Google has started to crack down on a lot of, I'll say like free plugins and things like that, where they install into Chrome and they they have direct access to the web page and sometimes they ask for access to like your Google Drive or your email and things like that. And so they have the what are called these authorization scopes, which is essentially just a URL that defines which service of Google that you're requesting access to and what your level of access is. And the one that I'm requesting, which is basically raw access to the IMAP server, is in what they call a restricted scope, which means that mm -hmm. I have to go through this additional certification program in order to in order for them to not revoke it from my company. Mm -hmm. So they say, here are some vendors that we recommend. One of these vendors has to certify your software as being valid and conforming to all of our standards. So I had to c contact them. Google's estimate for how much that cost is anywhere between fifteen and $75,000 a year. So I had to go through that. I went through it back in November, December timeframe. They literally came back and basically said, yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with your software, which is infuriating. At the same time, <laughs> it is helpful because now I don't have to deal with it for another year. Right. But let's be honest, like it is somewhat valuable to your company. So first of all, you need it, right? Because you need access to, to Gmail, right? It's sure. just so many, so many people use it. It's a cost of doing business. You got to do it. But then the other thing is from a confidence point of view, you can tell your customers, hey, Google came in here and certified this stuff. Like you don't have to worry about it. So I do think there's value to your business, even though it was annoying to have to go through that. But to get back to the question that Matt asked, so my answer would be, you know, I mean, Mike, said a lot of the important stuff already. It's all just code, man. You know, depending on where the code ends up running, it's all just code wherever it ends up being. The interesting thing about pricing models, and I definitely agree that distribution and pricing models are separate things. The fun thing about it, from my point of view, is that there actually are very few pricing models. There really are. Like it's either it's either free or you pay for it once or you pay for it a bunch of times over time. Really, I mean, it's really all that it is. And, and, you know, metered access can fall into that as well. But back in the day, when the software business was kind of first starting up, there was the idea of just free software, right? Anyone can download it, use it, it's free, whatever. And then they had shareware where anyone could download it and people asked you to pay, but you didn't really have to and it was up to you. And now that is kind of similar to the freemium model, like they're using different names for kind of the same thing where it's free to download it and you can use it. But if you want to unlock certain features, you got to pay for them. And that's what we used to call crippleware back in the day where you could download something and you could use it, but until you paid for it, certain functionality wouldn't be available. And the subscription software or the idea of licenses that renew is something that came along a little while after that because the, the, the pricing model used to be that you pay for something once and you own it and away you go. And then if there were additional fees, it would only they would only come when there was a major upgrade to the software, right? Like if you want version three and you had version two, well, then you got to pay some money. But at some point along the way, developers realized that continuous improvement is really what makes this thing, the development process work well and also provide value to the customers. And in order to fund continuous improvement, some kind of a subscription model makes more sense. You know, I mean, I would think if, Creative Cloud maybe would be an example of one of the first big um, shifts it's, in that model. It is. It is. And the fun fact is that Adobe, like some people that worked at Adobe actually reached out to me at the time because they saw what we were doing with our licensing model and they were like, you know, hey, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Like, you know, is that something that we, you know, how is it working for you? Are you getting complaints, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you know, I knew some of the people that were responsible for ending up implementing some of Adobe's licensing stuff. And don't, don't yell at me because I, I know a lot of people don't, <laughs> don't love the way some of that stuff ended up working out. But I don't know. I mean, it's just the funny thing to me is I, I don't think there are really, there aren't as many different pricing models as there are names for pricing models, at least in my opinion. What do you think, Mike? No, I, I would agree with you. And I think that one of of the things that's probably overlooked by most people is the fact that when you get into something like a subscription model, the reason it works well for the company that's providing the software is that it essentially evens out the cash flow. Because if you're mm -hmm. de if you're dependent upon a product where you've got a major release that comes out, version three or version four, like you get a lot of revenue very quickly when you first launch that new release, but it drops off dramatically after that. And then you are stuck in this situation where you have to come out with a new major release every so often in order to 
just jumpstart the company cash flow and be able to make ends meet. And then it's a budgeting problem on the back end for the company. And it 100%. just makes it harder to run the business. So with a subscription model, at least it's it provides more predictable revenue, which if you're a single founder or got a, a co-business owner or something like that, a co-founder, and you are running it with two or three or even a team of five or 10 people, if you've got reliable revenue coming in every month, you have so much more flexibility to do what you want to do with the business and, and in your own personal life as you would have, then you would if it was a, a one-time fee with upgrades between major releases. The internet is littered with companies that didn't make it to the end. In other words, they were trying to come out with the new version of the thing so they could generate more revenue and they ran out of revenue in trying to do that. Like, I mean, that's a thing that happened quite often. And, you know, I know that some people complain and they're like, well, I want to own the thing. Just like when I want to go to Home Depot and I want to buy something and I want to own it and I bring it home and no one charges me fees for renting this thing, right? But the difference is that no one is actively improving that thing that you brought home from Home Depot, right? Whereas with most of the SaaS products and a lot of the subscription software products, someone is actively improving the thing. So the thing that you own, the thing that you bought is not the thing that you own a year from now because it's been improved. One of the other things that I think is very, very common is that ideas in terms of what I'm going to build or what my SaaS is going to be or what my software product is going to be, they come from fixing your own problems. Like Patrick was mentioning, he's run into, you know, he uses various SaaS products. He thinks they suck and he thinks he, he could do a better job. Matt may be working for a client and the client has a specific need. So he builds a custom plugin for them. Jonathan may be working on a website for a client and realizes that there's a lot of commonalities between the website sites that he's being asked to build and you know is there a way to make a product out of that did blue tick come out of any particular thing that you or problem you needed to solve mike yeah so there were a couple of ones that came out from i had a previous product called audit shark that was aimed at the enterprise it was intended to do audit and <laughs> compliance which is audit shark do 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 oh, audit shark do no sorry go ahead yeah it was just so i was essentially trying to boil the ocean there where i didn't like the way that enterprise software was sold in the security world and mm. I didn't and what I was trying to do was I was trying to make it a uh, basically a, a SaaS subscription model so and you're trying to be a disruptor right That's yeah, the yeah yeah and I I was trying to do that and it honestly it just was not gonna fly like the product itself worked and it did what it needed to do but mm. finding people to driving people to my website and getting them to convert was just almost impossible and it's just that type of software is not sold that way because there's there's sales reps that, from like major security vendors that have that basically walk in the door and ask what the problems are of the IT director and then say, here are the solutions that we can provide you. Like, which where do you want to start? Mm. And they're not searching for the solutions. They're working with these sales reps. So I really just did not stand a chance with that business. But what I did recognize during the, the process of that was that doing email outreach to people, and there was a, a, a particular deal that I had that that comes to mind where I emailed them, I don't know, probably eight or 10 times before I finally got a response from them. And I was like, man, it'd be great if this was automated. And I looked around and I couldn't really find anything. And then the other situation was also at about the same time because I was responsible for handling the sponsorship side of things at Microcom. I had to reach out to all these people. And because getting somebody to respond to a sponsorship request or a rate card was not the top three things on their mind for the day, inevitably they'd let it slip because, oh, I know Mike, I'll get back to them later. And so then, then they wouldn't, and I'd have to remind them. And after a couple, maybe two, three, four emails, you know, they, they would almost always get back to me, but they just let them go because it was not a hair on fire priority for them. So in both of those situations, I said, well, it would be great to have a tool that automated this process. And initially I looked at it at the time and I decided not to do it because my thought was, oh, this is something that could, that would be applicable to conference organizers and who are people who are running sponsorships. And I didn't think that I could come up with a pricing model that would fit very well well, because unless you're running a lot of conferences in a year, the billing model for me would have to be that I'm charging so much more that they're going to look at it a lot more. It's going to be a high touch sales process. And I really wanted to avoid that. So I didn't end up pursuing it. And then kind of fast forward a few years and I realized that, hey, this is a general sales and follow up problem, not specific to running sponsorships. So both of those things kind of led me down this path. And that's kind of where I got the idea from. Yeah, and I have a longstanding belief that really, really good engineers are somewhat lazy. And if if they have if they experience a problem over and over like they would they would rather spend a whole bunch of time architecting a solution so that they then don't have to do anything right? yeah so yeah. this is kind of like you doing that where you're just like well okay this is a situation i've run into a few times i don't
don't feel like having to do the same manual stuff over and over again. Maybe I should build this thing and maybe I'm not the only one that that has had this problem, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I did. And I looked around and asked people and that's how I got the, that's, how I went down the path of getting the prepayments and pre-orders for blue tick before I even got started writing code. Yeah. It's a very ambitious kind of lazy though. <laughs> It is, but it's a unique combination. Like I've definitely seen it where a developer will be someone that they'll be like, oh, this sucks. Like I don't want to have to answer these emails. It's so boring and I don't want to do it. And maybe the answering the emails would only take 30 minutes, but they would prefer to spend the next five days <laughs> architecting a solution that lets them not have to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about what brings you happiness. And it, for most right. developers, I think writing code brings you happiness and dealing with people does not. So if you can write code <laughs> to deal with people, then you're, I, I mean, that's a golden situation. It really is. Right. I think Mike diagnosed it perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, I mean, Matt would be famous and retiring if it wasn't for the fact that he had to deal with people, right? So people would actually have to see your products, Matt. I know. Yeah. That's, that's, I solved the problem in the most fun way and don't have to deal with people using it other than myself. So really, I, you know, I think I figured it out. Except for the revenue model. Except I mean, for, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> I just got to connect that piece and then I'll be fine. Yeah, the revenue model is a little bit of a problem here. So, so what do you think, Jonathan? Are you going to, when are you going to get off the pot and build this SaaS thing that you've been thinking about doing for a while? Well, I'm, um, I'm actively searching for uh, a rogue scientist who could help me clone myself. Um, <laughs> As soon as soon as I can make that happen. No, I mean, I, I do think it's, you know, you've only got so much time in the day. And it's right. just... Well, would you be willing to give up? Like, would you be willing to start saying no to clients and booking off a good portion of your day for the next six months and maybe working a few extra hours for the next six months to make it happen? Man, I think that's, I think that's like the crux of the whole thing. And boy, right. is that a really hard thing to do. I mean, because I'm very much in the client service mm -hmm. business where I have one-on-one -on -one relationships with my clients and like I pay my mortgage by the work that I do for clients. And mm -hmm. so it feels, it would feel so wrong to start saying no to work. Okay. Well, let's say that an angel investor came in and gave you $2 million that you could use and they would still control how it was used. But the idea NY is- Studio 107 Ventures? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly- <laughs> That's exactly it. No, but they gave you a bunch of money. In other words, let's say that the the funding was not a concern. Right. Would you then take the time to build your own yes, thing? Or absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It's all about Pat the funding. What about you, Patrick? If the funding was not an issue, do you think you would stop what you were doing and try to build your own thing? Or would you continue on with kind of what you're doing? Yeah, if the funding was an issue, I mean, just for the reward of how much I would learn during that time, 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, the client work would be great if it weren't for the clients. But And, and Matt, I would propose the same thing to you but i'm going to add a caveat to it which is that you would have to publish something at the end of this like would you would you do it as well i i don't know can we wait three hours while i think about that because I, <laughs> I feel like it depends on how much control i would have to give up over the right. thing like i would almost rather be bootstrapped and never publish it than have requirements from somebody else and not be steering the well the mike that's ship. That's what MicroConf is, right? Is tell, telling developers that, hey, there's another way to do this. You don't have to be VC funded. You can bootstrap yourself, right? I mean, that's literally what MicroConf is about, right? Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, yeah, that's a good good uh, way to put it. Well, Mike, it has been fantastic having you on here. And uh, I appreciate you coming on. That about wraps it up for another episode of the devmode.fm podcast. If you'd like to have every episode delivered to your favorite player, you can subscribe via RSS or find us on iTunes or Google Play. I'm stopping it right here. So for the people that cut out during the middle of the outro, you're going to miss it and too bad for you. <laughs> so you guys were laughing at me, the man behind Bluetooth. Okay. It comes from King Harold Bluetooth Gormson, who is the king of Denmark, who united Denmark and Norway in the year 958. And he was also known for having a dead tooth, which was dark blue or gray in color. And it earned him the nickname Bluetooth. You guys think I'm making it up? It's all real. All right. And if you like what we're doing, please leave us a review on iTunes. It's the best place for help others find the show. You can also follow us on Twitter at devmode.fm, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Leave us a comment on the devmode.fm website where we can continue the conversation. And we have gotten a few new reviews on iTunes lately, which is fantastic. Like, Yay. keep it coming. It, it really does help. For the devmode.fm podcast, I'm Andrew Welch. I'm Patrick Harrington. I'm Jonathan Melville. And I'm Matt Stein. And thank you, Mike Tabor from bluetick.io for coming on. Thanks for having me. I got to find my window. Okay, here we go. <laughs>
true that i did live with mike's wife for i don't know like a year i don't know maybe more maybe ali would remember i'm not sure go um, on <laughs> well it, it was a purely platonic thing well at least as far as mike knows oh, it's not in the biblical sense okay <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking maybe ali on a future episode of death mode <sighs> no so mike, Sean, uh... i have to ask about the logo